I would like to introduce the next, uh, the next speaker, yeah. uh, Professor Michael Has Alaska. Alaska, yeah. Halaska, sorry, is currently a professor at the Department of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, in Charles University in Prague. And he has also, welcome. Okay, hello. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, speak up at this floor. It's uh, very interesting. I realize that I have to change my lecture quite a lot because I'm sure you are not interested in the number of uh, publications and so on, and you are more in publications and so on, and you are more interested in practical things, and maybe actually then I also get a practical feedback from you because this is, again, interesting actually for, for me as a physician. Uh, my topic is uh, gynecological cancer and pregnancy. I would like to start with a question. Has anyone cancer and pregnancy? I would like to start with a question. Has anyone from you heard about somebody who had uh, cancer during pregnancy? Okay, okay, so there are a few. But uh, to be honest, it is a rare disease and it is a rare situation. Uh, in our country, in the Czech Republic, we are 10, around 20 to 30 patients with cancer diagnosed during pregnancy. So it's a very small amount of patients, but when this happens, usually it's like a disaster for the whole family and for everybody who knows these patients. Why? These patients are, why? These patients are usually very young, so you can imagine that, okay, having cancer at a young age is always like shocking for everybody. But moreover, it's during a period which is supposed to be like the most joyable period of, uh, of a life of woman for the child and suddenly she's shocked with uh, this topic that uh, she has a cancer and that she has to undergo some examination and treatment and so on. And actually, unfortunately, some of the cancers are <laughs> advanced stage, so it means that uh, we try to so means that uh, we try to spare uh, the life of the, of the patient, but also we try to focus and to spare usually the life of the child as well. So at one shot, we are dealing with two lives, which makes it really uh, complicated. We started at our center to deal with uh, such patients around, I think, 15, 20, no, 15 years ago. And we found out that there are more and more patients, uh, but they were usually spread around the whole country. Nobody knew about them. And uh, our aim was to con and uh, our aim was to concentrate these patients into one uh, center, which is really dedicated, which uh, has the knowledge, but also the skills to deal with uh, with such uh, such a patient. And actually, I think we succeeded and uh, most of the patients in the Czech Republic. So uh, we, uh, we developed a team and we work on it uh, continuously. Um, the main message from uh, my lecture should be this, treat, not terminate. Because in the past, it was uh, quite normal that uh, with a, it was uh, quite normal that uh, with a uh, diagnosis of cancer during pregnancy, most of the physicians and most of, but also the patients or the mothers, they thought, okay, so now we have to terminate the pregnancy and we have to concentrate on, on the treatment. But actually, found that uh, if you just slow down a little bit at that moment, you perform several diagnostic procedures, then you can find ways how to, in, in a lot of situations, how to preserve the pregnancy or at least to preserve fertility because both at least to preserve fertility because both are big issues for for women so treat not terminate why do we speak about gynecological cancers i mean we could speak about all cancers it's when you look at the slide you can see that these are epidemiological data showing uh, which cancer types are the most uh, common ones diagnosed during pregnancy. And you can see that gynecological cancer, cervical, breast, ovarian, uh, belong to the top six uh, of all the cancers. All the other ones are quite, quite rare.
from epidemic. Important. This is a very interesting um, publication from Sweden. As you know that the Swedish, they have a very good registries, or the Scandinavian countries have a very good uh, statistical registries. And they looked at the prognosis of patients who are diagnosed during pregnancy and who are diagnosed during pregnancy, and they compared them with patients diagnosed outside of pregnancy. And this was a very important finding because it showed that in majority of cases, the prognosis or the, the cancer is not influenced by pregnancy. And again, in the past, it was thought that, for instance, having a breast cancer during pregnancy, okay, the pregnancy is speeding up because of the hormones, the growth of the tumor, it negatively influences the prognosis of the patient. So again, that's the reason why you have to terminate the pregnancy. So to terminate the pregnancy. So this was actually very important, and this helped us to think how to treat the patient with preservation of the pregnancy. So that's what we do in the beginning when we uh, have such a patient referred. Usually they are in a hurry and they said, so tomorrow we have to terminate or whatever. And we say, no, no, first let's find out more about the disease. And actually that's how we do it everywhere. Let's do imaging tests. Let's do the staging procedures. And then uh, we have time. We can wait for three, five days. I know it's stressful, but it's really interesting. Do we have available? Actually, we have almost the same as outside of pregnancy. Because a lot of cancers, and especially gynecological cancers, what we need is ultrasound. Ultrasound is not harmful for the pregnancy, so it's not a problematic issue. And then actually the second most important uh, again is not harmful for the pregnancy, except of this contrast agent, um, gadolinium, it's used to, to have a better picture, so this is contraindicated. But anyway, the MRI is here. And out of, out of these two uh, diagnostic procedures, actually, we find out a lot, a lot. Uh, there are some other ones, like chest X-ray, we know it's safe. Abdominal X-ray, it's safe. It's true that um, CT scans, they deliver too much of, uh, of the ionizing uh, uh, of the ionizing radio no, therapy, so they are contraindicated, but actually we don't need them because we can replace them with MRI. So first, imaging, and then we sit down with the patient, but also with the husband or partner, husband or partner, uh, because we want to speak all together, and we put down uh, always uh, those physicians who are involved, so it means gynecologist, oncologist or oncogynecologist, and perinatologist, because the patient uh, with a, the patient uh, with a partner they have to have uh, information about the pregnancy also. They have a lot of questions always, so that's why we have to sit down. Also, unfortunately, in some cases we know that the prognosis is 100% dismal and. In some cases, we know that the patient, and actually the partner has to be informed about this, that this will happen, because he will take over the care of the kid. And uh, you can believe me that sometimes it's really difficult decisions. We have had patients who had three kids and they were in, they were in the beginning of the pregnancy and then the, the partner said, come on, I, partner said, come on I, I, I cannot handle without you. We have no support and so on. On the other hand, majority of, of couples they always decide to continue with the pregnancy. So this was actually an exception, but it is an issue which has to be brought up and said clearly to both of them in the beginning of them in the beginning of the of the talk. Then we look at the uh, length of the pregnancy where we are. You see that the pregnancy lasts for 40 uh, weeks. It's divided into trimesters. So actually, based on the trimester we have different therapeutics. And this slide should uh, show that how, how we deal. In certain uh, parts of the pregnancy, we can do a surgery. In certain parts of pregnancy, we can do chemotherapy. Certain parts, we can do radiotherapy. 
and this I'm now talking with a and this I'm now talking with a intention to spare the the pregnancy. <clears throat> In the past, again, it was quite common that um, when cancer was diagnosed, let's say around 28th or 30th week of pregnancy, always it was uh, prematurely terminated pregnancy, the, the child will be fine, it will be in the intensive care unit and we will treat you. And actually it has been found that this is a bad idea and I'll show you a little bit later on why. So discussion, the specialist, partner, patient, and uh, information about the cancer type, about the size, stage, and week of pregnancy. All of these issues, when put together, can give, the, give us the plan for the patient, and of course it's upon the patient whether she accepts it or not, because she's a part. Now, here I have, now, here I have some <clears throat> general um, slides about the, about, uh, the therapeutic options. And actually, I hope you will excuse me, I tried to put there some photos. I know that some of them are uh, not really nice looking, but that's the reality. And actually, you as a special part of the community which already saw a lot of uh, photos and a lot of surgeries, so you will handle it. But I would like to give you like a more insight what, what is the problem uh, with dealing with these uh, patients. So generally about surgery. So the so generally about surgery. So the issue is, can we do a surgery during pregnancy? Yes, yes we can. Uh, there are new uh, anesthetics which are uh, safe for the fetus. The anesthesiologists they know it. Actually, we operate during surgery quite often. It's not during pregnancy, but for instance, appendicitis or some broken leg or or there are many other options where we operate. So this is quite normal, and we have a lot of data about the safety and about also the risks of uh, surgery. <coughs> generally, we try to postpone, generally, we try to postpone a little bit the surgery after the first trimester, because first trimester is the period where the fetus is most harmful for any toxic or teratogenic agent. So we try to postpone it. Then there are several <clears throat> steps and maneuvers which we handle during uh, this such a surgery. For instance, when we operate in the abdominal cavity, we try not to touch the uterus as much as possible. We have to give uh, the patient more fluid because the patients, pregnant patients, they tend to have high hypotensis and this influences negatively the fetus and this influences negatively the fetus. Uh, we can also do laparoscopic procedures uh, under special circumstances. So there are a lot of things around. Uh, pregnant patients are at much higher risk of thromboembolia. This is a very important thing. So this is the patient, because normally uh, the risk of uh, thromboembolism during pregnancy is uh, elevated um, almost 40 times. And once you have a diagnosis of cancer and treatment, then it increases even more. So these are all issues that need to be uh, appointed right straight from the option chemotherapy. And I'm happy uh, to <coughs> also introduce uh, my friend Frederick Amand, who is the next speaker. And uh, actually together we work for a long period of time dealing on this topic because uh, chemotherapy was one of the... Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> which, uh, which was supposed to be totally forbidden. But uh, what um, Frederick's uh, group did, that they went step by step, first using a mice model, later they moved uh, to Africa and used baboons, they moved uh, to Africa and used baboons, and, and through that knowledge they gained, we uh, learned which chemotherapy is safe, which is not safe, how to administer it, when, and so on. So this was a long-lasting event. We know exactly which chemotherapies are safe, which are not safe, how to follow up the children. So it's a special project uh, which is prospective, and uh, there needs to be uh, collaboration with uh, 
neurologists, with uh, psychologists, we do specialists, with uh, psychologists, we do special IQ tests, a lot of examinations of, of the children, so we know that they are developing well after the delivery, and also to evaluate the side effects of, of chemotherapy. And actually, most of the data we have are uh, succeeded to publish it uh, in several uh, important journals. So this is, uh, for instance, from New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the most prestigious journals in, in, uh, in the whole world. And uh, the finding is, for instance, that uh, children that are after chemotherapy, they have exactly the same, that are after chemotherapy, they have exactly the same IQ scores as uh, other uh, kids. But the important thing is that uh, the IQ score lowers if they are born prematurely. And actually, it is 2.5 points. I told you before, uh, doing a premature delivery is not a good idea because you will not help the kid uh, during her, his, li his or her life. So chemotherapy is really interesting topic which has evolved and nowadays is um, quite frequently used. Evolved and nowadays is um, quite frequently used. Radiotherapy is uh, another therapeutic modality which is interesting because it delivers uh, ionization to, to uh, the fetus, which is teratogenic. But uh, uh, particular parts of, uh, of the body could be irradiated even during pregnancy. Of course, you cannot irradiate cervical cancer because it's just next to the kid and that would uh, be disastrous. But some uh, breast cancer tumors, some cancers, but some uh, breast cancer tumors, some uh, brain tumors, they could be safely irradiated. Uh, in the past, actually, we had um, uh, we incorporated this uh, shielding that should be done to protect the kids. Actually, in, in the recent years, we found out that, that we should actually not do it. Uh, it comes from uh, from the studies from. Uh, from modeling of, uh, of the scattered uh, ionization. So it's also for us interesting. And throughout the time, we are changing also the, the therapy. So we, have all therapy. so we have all these modalities. Again, there is a possibility to induce preterm delivery, but uh, it's, it's used only in a few certain cases. And it's because uh, the earlier we uh, deliver the kit, the more problems the kit will have. The neonate with eyes, uh, with breathing, also I told you about the IQ scores. So that's why we always try to bring the pregnancy to the normal end at 40th week of pregnancy as possible. It is even better for us, in, for instance, in breast cancer, to give, in, for instance, in breast cancer, to give one cycle of chemotherapy or two cycles of chemotherapy and to deliver at term rather than prepare a premature delivery without chemotherapy. So uh, sure we are about the safety of, of chemotherapy. Now in the second part of the lecture, I will try to uh, concentrate uh, on each diagnosis uh, of gynecological cancer and uh, especially ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, and I added one more slide on breast cancer. Now, uh, breast cancer. Now, uh, cervical cancer is actually one of the most interesting ones. Uh, usually during pregnancy, it is diagnosed at an early stage it's because the patients, they go to a frequent examinations, uh, so it is quite easy to as a small tumors. For cervical cancer, there are different types of treatment. Uh, for early stage cancers, the cornerstone treatment is a surgery of, of the cervix or uterus with lymphadenectomy. That's a procedure where we try to find uh, where we try to find uh, lymph nodes which are in the abdominal cavity and which drain the tumor or, or the organs. And those are the places uh, which could be involved by metastatic, 
uh, in the first row. So that's why we call it a staging procedure that uh, is tumors in, uh, in any place. So for the treatment of the cervix, uh, you can imagine that here there is, a, there is a child and we need to operate quite close. So there are different procedures. Um, we try to evaluate them, some of them cervix, some of them take part of the cervix and also the tissue which is around, which is quite a uh, difficult procedure. They suture the uterus to the vagina afterwards, so it's a long-lasting procedure with a high um, uh, blood loss and so on. So there are, and then there is uh, this um, lymphadenectomy staging, which uh, has been evaluated, and I don't know whether you have heard from some lectures about sentinel lymph node mapping, so actually now with uh, new instruments using such a special green color, we can also perform it green color, we can also perform it uh, during pregnancy. So it's like almost outside of pregnancy. But of course, to be honest, if you imagine this is a small picture from uh, abdominal cavity, the, there was a pregnancy of uh, 13th week of pregnancy. The enlarged uterus, of course, God. so it is not that this surgery can be done by anyone. No, it has to be with somebody who has done several of these surgeries, who knows small ticks and trips, how, <laughs> ticks and trips, how to handle it, how to use it, and uh, not to injure the uterus, of course. So the surgery to injure the uterus, of course. So the surgery is feasible, but of course more difficult. Once we uh, reach, for instance, 22nd week of pregnancy. Afterwards, this procedure is not uh, possible anymore because of the size of the uterus. But actually, most of the patients are diagnosed uh, in the beginning of the pregnancy at an early stage, so we, we can operate. We do such surgeries quite rare, so probably two per year. So it's not a it's not common procedure, to be honest, from the whole Czech Republic. Now this is just to show what, what we see during uh, such a procedure, how we uh, have special instruments to look for the, for the lymph nodes. Uh, it is quite interesting that it is possible uh, to, to perform it also during pregnancy. Now, uh, in cervical cancer, uh, the cornerstone treatment is surgery. But in certain cases, we can also prepare the tumor and shrink it before the surgery by using of neodymium chemotherapy. So depending on the uh, week of pregnancy and the size of the tumor, sometimes we have to combine this, this treatment, chemo and, uh, and surgery. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes uh, it is uh, not possible to uh, to preserve the uh, to preserve the uh, the fetus, sometimes we have to terminate the pregnancy. So there are s several different options. Uh, the surgery is uh, really difficult. Uh, of course, it is a very sad story. Sometimes, uh, again, we do such surgery such surgeries uh, twice, three times per per year. So again, it's uh, it's uh, it's rare situation. Sometimes in case of uh, advanced uh, cancer, uh, we have to use chemo radiotherapy because uh, the tumor is so large, tumor is so large that you cannot operate, which makes uh, all the situation even worse because there is still the fetus, so you have to terminate the pregnancy again, then give the chemo radiotherapy. So those are really unfortunate uh, cases. Now, uh, from cervical cancer, we move to ovarian uh, malignancies or ovarian cancer, uh, which are uh, also uh, belong to one to the common ones. Uh, they are interesting because, uh, uh, like of all pregnancies, are complicated with some kind of tumor on the ovary. It is very common. Just imagine three percent of all pregnancies. Fortunately, majority of them are benign conditions and they disappear. 
But for us, it's difficult to find out exactly the small amount of cases when this tumor mass is malignant. And uh, normally, outside of pregnancy, we use ultrasonography and some kind of tumor markers. Tumor markers we cannot use during pregnancy because they are always elevated because of pregnancy. So we have only ultrasonography. Again, it has been it has to be somebody who is really skilled in ultrasonography. It's not that any gynecologist who has an ultrasound can do it. Those are only several few people who would be reliable. And again, when we operate, just imagine that this is the uterus, for instance. The tumors sometimes are large. They can be 20 centimeters large. So some of the surgeries are quite difficult again, but feasible. We try to combine it again with chemotherapy because uh, ovarian cancer is a sensitive tumor to chemotherapy. So uh, the combination of these two methods uh, is, quite, uh, uh, is quite, uh, quite common. I didn't touch the topic of uh, way of delivery. In cervical cancer, in most of the cases, the patients, they have to deliver by caesarean section. But this is uh, a different uh, story with ovarian cancer as the patient is after, is after the surgery of the tumor mass, so there is uh, no problem with any blockage. So these patients, for instance, they, they can deliver spontaneously. Spontaneous delivery has another advantage because the next day you can start or you can continue with chemotherapy by if you deliver by Cisens, by if you deliver by cesarean section, then because of healing, you should postpone it, let's say, four or five days. So. Uh, spontaneous delivery has a lot of a uh, lot of advantages, and uh, we prefer to to deliver spontaneously most of these patients. Uh, recent years, we see more and more such patients. Usually, vulva cancer is uh, comes in elderly patients, 60 uh, years plus. But in recent years, we have patients 35 years. Last week, we have a 26-year-old girl, uh, woman. And again, uh, it is sometimes difficult decision because you have to do a huge radical surgery. Of course, this is uh, a problem for a spontaneous delivery. So majority of these cases actually will deliver by caesarean infection, but, but not all, but majority of them. Uh, again, it is interesting. Uh, again, it is interesting that we can use sentinel lymph node mapping, so we act as in non-pregnant patients. Breast cancer. Sorry for interrupting you. We are nearly running out of time. Sorry. I am. I am having two last slides. Thank you. Breast cancer uh, is one of the most common ones. Uh, it is uh, important because usually these cancers are diagnosed at late stage. That's a problem. We have a lot of patients with uh, tumors seven, eight centimeters large with a very dismal prognosis. So that's a very problematic issue. It's, be it's a very problematic issue. It's because the breasts are uh, ch changed during pregnancy. Usually also the patients, but also the physicians, they say, no, all this tumor, well, you can palpate something, but it's normal during pregnancy. Don't worry about it and so on. So uh, there are uh, delays of the treatment and actually delays of the diagnosis. So usually these patients are late diagnosed, unfortunately. We can do surgery the same as outside of pregnancy. We can use almost, almost exactly the same, same chemotherapy as outside. There are certain subgroups uh, where it is not possible, then subgroups uh, where it is not possible, but uh, that's not that common, fortunately. And I would like to uh, finish with this slide, again, turning my attention to the next speaker, because that's the project. It's called, uh, it's run under uh, the umbrella of ESGO, INSIP, Intensity uh, in Pregnancy and Fertility. Uh, this is the web page. There are a lot of physicians involved from different countries. We cooperate, we produced around 30 or 40 uh, publications. Most of them have actually uh, management changing. Most of them have actually uh, management changing impact. So we we are very proud of it, and it's only because of. Uh,
perfect networking, thanks to ESGO and our group, that we can collect more cases. Just imagine 30 cases per year in our country. But if you do at uh, Austria, suddenly you can have 150 cases and you can actually find out scientifically something out of it. So this is very important. And actually, uh, we are also proud that right now we are the leading group in the whole world for cancer in pregnancy. If you go to any meeting, our uh, publications and our group, because we are really very well managed. And uh, that's, that's the last one, take home messages. Uh, I think you have heard everything, so I will not uh, repeat it. Just uh, again, by going back to the first slide, we try to treat, again, by going back to the first slide, we try to treat, not terminate. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm especially pleased that you say that the treat not be pleased that you say that the treat not terminate in, uh, in cancer in pregnancy. So I don't know if uh, anyone have a question, short question. Please go to the microphone. Stichting on Life, the Netherlands. Uh, my question is, uh, you follow up the mothers and the uh, children. Um, and I was wondering if you also follow up for the kids if they have more risk of cancer, since we know, of course, for chemotherapy, by chemotherapy, by, if you have it yourself, you have an enlarged risk of a second tumor. Perfect question. It's true. We do follow them up. Uh, some of the children are already old. Uh, we have administered first chemotherapy in 1994, actually. So these children are grown up. Fertility uh, issues in these survivors, because giving chemo during pregnancy, for sure it can have an impact on the ovaries. We don't know how do they uh, handle pregnancy or if they can get pregnant once they are old. So these are all issues which are incorporated in the, in the project. Oh, and incorporated in the in the project oh, and they they need to be evaluated on the other hand i would like to say one important thing always just look at the evolvement of medicine the knowledge we have now the knowledge we had 10 years before and the knowledge we will have 10 years after so to be and the knowledge we will have 10 years after so to be honest i would risk some secondary malignancy in the child because I know that when this comes to be the problem in 20 or 30 years, the medicine will be much far, farther away. So that's what I explained to, to the mothers. So that's what I explained to, to the mothers. So, okay, there is a chance that your child will have a cancer, but it will be in 30 or 40 years. I don't think you, this should be the issue that makes you to uh, terminate the pregnancy. No, I wouldn't, uh, uh, I, I, I would agree it's more if um, then the, or something, I don't know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's true Just that, to know. Yes. Yeah. Well, there are, for instance, cases where there was a transmission of the cancer cells to the baby. Okay. So all the placentas, for instance, during the deliveries need to be examined histologically. It's rare, but it happens. Examined histologically, it's rare, but it happens. There were uh, recently very interesting findings uh, of, a, of a transmission of cervical cancer, with, um, breast cancer, some hematologic malignancies. So all these uh, kids for melanoma, they have to be followed. Actually, nobody knows how exactly, but this is the this is one of.